The degree of a country's love for culture usually demonstrates its quality deep inside the soul. Russia is proud to be home to the State Hermitage Museum, one of the most respected art museums in the world. Made up of six buildings, it sits along the banks of the Neva River. At the center of the museum is the Winter Palace, which was originally Peter the Great's winter residence. It's where the rarest collection of the world's treasures are. The State Hermitage Museum is one of the largest museums in the world, housing arts and culture items. Three million of them are housed in six huge buildings around here. Among the collection, painting is the biggest feature. And there are some painting coming from China. You could see on the wall, for example, coming from the 18th century in China. Some of them are actually from unknown artists throughout Chinese dynasties, but you could see they're being beautifully presented here, and it also reflects the huge interest about China coming from Russia throughout history. From paintings to furniture, from porcelains to wood carves, even though the collection in the China room of the Hermitage Museum is quite limited. But one could say they are one of the most important resources that Russians would go to when it comes to the Chinese culture. And among the exhibits in the China Room, I noticed there is a pair of cranes coming from the 18th century, according to the introduction. Cranes are symbols of longevity and prosperity in Chinese culture. As far as I understand, it is also one of the best and favorable animals of the directors of the museum for generations. The former director of the Hermitage Museum said all he envy are the night watchmen of the museum and also the cranes that are flying to Egypt. Well, jokes put aside. What I'm going to say here is we're going to have an exclusive interview with the director of the State Hermitage Museum, Mr. Mikhail Piotrovsky. And let's listen in what he has to say. Mr. Director, welcome to CGTN. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. I always wonder, as a director of the largest art museums in the world, and an archaeologist yourself, how do you see history? You know, it's a very important and good question, because the museum gives you a possibility to interpret the history by yourself. The museum is not a book and not a textbook. It doesn't, well, uh, insist on certain interpretation. It will give you possibilities of interpretation. Like an archaeologist, he finds some pieces of building or in a sculpture, and then he decides or he imagines how it should like it look like and so. To understand the exhibit, you must, we help you, but you must be educated. You must read. In general, the best thing of visiting a museum, you come and look around, then you go and take a book, or oh, today you just take out your computer and look for the names and study, and then you go back and see again, look again at the objects. A hundred years ago, it's a big year for Russia and for the rest of the world, of course. And among the exhibits you are having this year, some could be very controversial objects. For example, the bloody shirt of Nicholas II when he was hurt in Japan. So. How do you present history, and how do you think people would interpret history through your exhibitions? It's a big question mark. We choose what we show, and we think it's our right to choose, to sh choose what we show, and we give you people possibility to think about it and to discuss it. We don't insist. And so it could be controversial, it's okay, it must be. Everything is controversial, art is controversial. So uh, talking about the uh, shirt of uh, Nicholas II, the bloody one. Uh, there could be different interpretations, but it is important to show it. Not always. It's not good to show a bloody shirt permanently. But when we have 100 years of him being killed, we can show his blood, but not the blood which was split in the Ekaterinburg, but it's not before. We can speak about Japan and relations. We can speak about Russian imperialism, which was planning to conquer this part of the world. We can speak about the revolution. We can speak about the uh, style and fashion of the shirt, how it was built. So many things. And we're happy that we can give people opportunity to think about so many things. Mm. But you are talking about 100 years history thing. 
What about the recent history? Russia, the former Soviet Union, went through so much. Your people as well. Do we have the guts and the courage to face all the zigzagging in recent history? And as a museum, how do you see that question? Uh, you know, uh, we are in the middle of all this. And we are extremely important. When you have all this turmoil of until, after Soviet Union, when Soviet Union was dismantled and collapsed and all the problems, the museum, as a cultural institution, should, uh, has all museums have shown courage to go on in doing our work and showing the people that with all these big changes, the culture is what stays forever. On huge occasions, Russia is hosting international events, the Olympic Games and the upcoming World Cup as well. I understand the square right outside the Hermitage is likely to be the celebration place. And that, of course, is going to have an impact on the cultural heritage in the museum. How will that work out eventually, Mr. Director? Well, we have we develop uh, different rules. We don't say, well, impossible. We say it's impossible. But there are rules. For instance, when there is a big event on the Palace Square, we measure the strength of the sound. And there is a certain level which agreed upon. If it's uh, upper or low, uh, upper than we agree, we call the companies that please put it lower, and they do it lower. We uh, forbid this and that. A lot of things are forbidden to be done on the Palace Square on the base of our initiatives. So it, it helps. Mr. Director, you are very direct, if I could say. Because in some interviews I even read that you are saying almost more than half of the concerts being held in the square do not work to be held in St. Petersburg. <laughs> I mean, you heard the interest of some interest groups, I'm sure, over the years. What does it take to have that gut? Well, you need a little bit of courage, but you need a lot of diplomacy. You must explain people, and you must also propose the solution, the rules. So we propose the, propose the rules. I always say, well, you can have whatever you want on the Palace Square, but it must be like a flash mob. You come and say you do whatever. Don't make the construction going for 10 days and 10 days and 10 days and so on. There are two things, two layers of things, Mr. Director, if I could ask further. One, of course, is your relationship as a director of one of the most well-known museums in the world with the government. Secondly, it's the fact that Russia has been under sanctions over the years. And how is your relationship with the West, particularly when it comes to exchanges of exhibits uh, and also with museums in other parts of the world? Uh, you know, this issue has nothing to do with current situation. Before all the sanctions, we have always been under sanctions. We always demand, when we send an exhibition to any country, we need a very clear guarantee that the objects will come back in time. Now, for many years, we don't have no culture exchange of the exhibition with the United States, because the United States doesn't give us a state guarantees of, of uh, well, immunity from seizure. We say we have a very good, law, very good laws. They're good, but it's not enough in today's situation. So, uh, so we develop and we change. We change the whole system of uh, international legislation. That there do exist. There exist uh, different kinds of immunities uh, which protect art in all the things. It's a result of our activities and fights. The State Hermitage Museum is such a pride of Russia that Vladimir Putin, the Russian president, personally came out and presented the Hermitage with a Fabergé egg to mark the institution's 250th anniversary about five years ago. He minced no words in describing his fascination with the museum like tens of millions of Russians. It is hard to imagine that 250 years ago, the museum's collection began with 225 paintings bought from abroad by Catherine the Great, and now it houses more than 3 million works. The Hermitage is certainly an attraction for millions of people from our nation and around the world. World leaders visiting Russia also frequented the Hermitage. German Chancellor Angela Merkel in 2013, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, in 2017, just to name a few. But what about your relations with your government officials? You were named by the Prime Minister, and also you have a person-to-person -person meeting with the President, President Putin, for example, last year. So what were discussed in those meetings, and how do you persuade your government top leaders 
to be able to protect the cultural heritage as much as you cherish it? Oh, well, different examples. Of, well, in general, our governments of nowadays and president and prime minister, they have been grown up in St. Petersburg. Yes. They know Hermitage, so they're uh, prepared. Is uh, that an easier job for you then? Well, it's, it's sometimes easier, sometimes not. Uh, so, from time to time, just one of the last meetings, I explained to them that we, the culture, needs special legislation. We need special law which gives cult uh, culture inside the country protection from different kinds of uh, new laws which prohibit this, prohibit that. Our uh, realm must be free of many other rules which exist outside. And President agreed and said, okay, you say the laws are wrong, prepare the new law and then we'll see. So now we're working on the new law which will protect and give session. What's going to be the centerpiece of this new law, as you say? Uh, the certain piece of this, this new law will be uh, understanding the culture as a special realm. Uh, culture has its own rules. For instance, you can't, you can show naked figures in the museum. You can't show them in the street. And something like this. We can use it also for very serious things like uh, protection of people of culture from uh, different tricks of the uh, in the financial things and the financial rules and things like this. You know, about protection of cultural heritage, of course, what we have just said is important. Another thing, there's a debate going on in the world about where the cultural heritages belong to. As we know throughout history, there were colony, there were occupation, invasion, and things like that. Cultural heritage spread around the world through different means. So, as a director of the largest, one of the largest art museums in the world, how do you see that issue? It's the art belongs to the people and the art belongs to the world, especially now when the world is global. So the main thing is accessibility. The, all the objects must be accessible to the people in general. If they're in the museum, it's okay, everybody can see them in the museum. If they're in a the place where they have been built, okay, let them stay there, let's not take them to the museum. But let's not begin to move things from one place to another. One thing is important. Art is, belongs to everybody, but it's not a property. Don't measure art in the, uh, according to ideas of property, money, then we'll never find a solution. All this collection is presented to the people, and 50 or 60 percent of the things are considered to be world treasure because they have been brought to museums and shown in the museum and so on. Greek sculpture was not appreciated before it became, well, put and pronounced in all the museums and blah, 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 Greek sculpture, Greek and Roman sculpture, so, and other things. Museums make uh, culture real, appreciated by the people. It's very important. We make, we produce this cultural product, which w must be accessible. For instance, we have built open store, a building every year, big open storages where everything which is in the Hermitage is accessible. You can see whatever you want, whatever things. This is a solution. But the things which are found in different places, they must stay there. And every place, every country, including Russia, has a lot of things to do just to protect things which are in the earth, which are discovered, which are robbed and sold on the black market. So this is the field. Mr. Director, you are an expert of Oriental Studies. The Middle Eastern, or greater, greater Middle East, is exactly your object. How do you see the realities of the region these days, particularly the clashes among religions, among civilizations, some even argue, as an archaeologist yourself? Well, as archaeologist, I'm certainly try to help to protect just the uh, cultural objects. Uh, because cultural objects don't only mean the cultural objects, they show you the continuity of civilization there. Because the people, this, some of the fanatics which are destroying uh, pre-Islamic art, they want to destroy all the connections, cultural connections between the epochs and so on. So we want, we must, will protect this understanding that the culture is one, the history is one. There is you no, know, the civilization must be friendly. Different is beautiful. What is the main thing which well, we try to explain to the people? Uh, in general, uh, Middle East is such a special place. There are all these fights between civilizations, cultures, and so on. Maybe it's, for the whole world, it's kind of a laboratorium for fighting and discussing. The biggest problem today, that today's was are terrible, they are annihilating everything, not like the wars of the Middle uh, Ages and so on. So we have to protect all these conflicts from using the strongest weapons possible, just to make them a little bit sensible, even in their fights.
But Russia, of course, plays a very active role these days, particularly for the issue of Syria, for example. Some would accuse you of uh, using the name of culture and cultural protection, in fact, making a political impact there in those regions. Uh, you know, uh, certainly protection of culture is, has a political impact and must have. Politics must defend culture, like they're defending nature, like they're defending human rights. It's the same story. Sometimes you must use force, and so that's why I mentioned Palmyra, because maybe the choice of Palmyra exactly in the beginning of Russian involvement in Syria was also from the cultural uh, point of view, and it was a good thing. It's not public relations, it's just the opposite. But should the intellectual take size in terms of controversy, in terms of wars, in terms of politics? Your thoughts, sir? I think intellectual must be involved and might be asked and and we give we don't it's good for us. We don't give orders. We propose different solutions and somebody has to choose what is what are the priorities. So we are in a good position. And then we can say, Oh, you have it was a wrong choice. We propose you different ways. Mm. The role of intellectual like you is very interesting in our today's world. Um, you earlier in one of your articles argued there has been a loss of intelligentsia in the world. I wonder what you meant in that word and also in a place as unique as Russia. How does that work? Uh, you know, it's a very important issue because there was a certain period in the 19th century, beginning of the 20s, when we had intelligentsia in, not only in Russia, it is a Russian word, but in all over the world, where the people of the intellectual work, especially the teachers, journalists, uh, students and professors of the university have been considered moral authorities. Nowadays, they are not considered moral authorities. Sometimes it's our fault, sometimes it's the fault of the time. Uh, intelligent have been people, who, because they are intellectuals, they are worse, they're, they have been people with conscience, and it was understood by everybody that if the teacher says something, it is important, not only for the students, for everybody, professor of the university is something, a writer says something, you must listen to him more than to or general or president or prime minister. Nowadays it's gone, or partly gone. You heard a lot of different chaotic voices these days on any issue, the debates go on. But then intellectuals begin to lose their voice because they don't want to involve in some of the nasty debates, particularly those debates that don't make sense to them. But on the other hand, their voice is being lost from then on. How do you see that controversy, that dilemma? You are right, they are not participating, but they must participate. You, know, you, can, you, can, you are citing my interviews. I am talking about everything, about which what I know even a little bit. Now we have been 5G and I have been talking, and I am going to talk very strongly how the digital economy is dangerous for the people. How uh, smart city could be a terrible city and we're going to talk also we use technology we love technology but we're always so we're always trying to we try all to speak out and, and and make make other people speak out because we must be critical but critical in general intellectual not just participating in political things it's another story also everybody can do this but just to be critical in general get some ideas which make uh, your people of your world authority to other people. You have the patience to be critical of thinking? You have the courage to be critical thinking? We have a fantastic museum behind us. That's what we, we don't, my speak, what I'm saying is not just me, it's the museum. Museum where I've grown up here, working here, my father worked here, so I feel that I have this right. These objects speak, they help me to speak. That's Mr. Director, one important thing in the world, even though we are globalized, but people argue we are burning our own bridges in terms of connecting with one another. How do you see as an archaeologist and as a museum director, one of the biggest ones, again I emphasize on that, the bridges that our ancestors managed to create and yet we failed to rebuild? Uh, we certainly we must protect the bridges and maybe we must to build new bridges permanently, you know? Like, well, if the bridge is from wood, there is a flood, you make a new bridge, maybe in another place. So we must make new bridges, new style of bridges, because museum is exactly a bridge. 
You know, the ancient Silk Road, even though it is not literally a bridge, and yet it has served as a cultural bridge among so many different civilizations, kingdoms, people. Today, people wonder whether those glorious times could be revived again, or are we just naive in believing the description of history, thinking it was glorious? Mr. Director. We're a little bit naive, because certainly <laughs> there was a glory, a glory like our time. There's its own glory, and there is things which are not very glorious. But certainly it shows it's very important to show us, to make us a little bit humble, because you see that in all these ancient times, in Middle Ages, the globalism was existing already, without all these satellites, and so it was, it was there. People have been connected, they have been knowing each other, they have been bringing things from here to there and there to here, and they knew different cultures. So we must learn from them, and just to be humble, to understand we are not better, if we are not better, so let's uh, learn from them how they managed to do this. How did it function? Because it was functioned fantastically, it was good for everybody, mm. and it was a great symbol of things that the world is one world. If your president, President Putin, who is busy building the Eurasian economic community, which is a bridge in a way, or the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, who is working on the Belt and Road Initiative, which is another bridge, not literally, but rather in the idea, ask you for advice coming from ancient civilization. How did they get it right? What would you say, Mr. Director? Uh, you know, the rulers don't like direct advice. <laughs> 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 I, I'll advise, please, some power museums to make some <laughs> joint venture to do something, because what we are doing is exactly what is your ideas are the Chinese idea of the self, Root, the uh, Eurasian idea of uh, Russian government and Putin. This is exactly what we are doing. So help us to develop museums, our exhibitions, things like this. This is the advice. We are the best help for your ideas. I do have a final set of questions for you, Mr. Director. Both you and your beloved father serve as director of the Armitage. Different generations. Who do you think is doing a better job? Mr. Director, well, or shall I put it in the other way? How do you see the different sets of challenges and achievements in different generations? Well, first of all, certainly my father was doing a better job, <laughs> and his generation was much better than ours. Why would you say that? Because this was a generation of the people who lived in a very difficult circumstances, eternal, of, uh, the international, and so on, and they survived, they survived it as intellectuals. The two world wars. Two world wars. The terrible times in Russia, repressions, political totalitarianism, this way and this, that way, a lot of things, uh, poverty. So they managed to keep the intellectual level, and this, I speak about the whole generation. Uh, and that's one thing. But certainly challenges are a little bit uh, different. Well, when I became director, I said, well, my father has no challenge in money for the museum, but there was ideology. Now we have no ideology, but no money. <laughs> No, Come on, you got a lot of money. No, 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 no we're coming money. back. Yes. Now we're back. Now we have money, uh, and now we have everybody trying to interfere into museum life to say you must do this, so you must do not, and not, not only the government, the government the less. People, everybody has its own opinion. Now we have these problems with international relations, uh, because, well, we survive, we work, but it certainly is an obstacle, so we have to find solutions for this, which is more or less exactly what was in my father's time. Have you talked to your father about this earlier? Well, my father is dead for many years, but, but I have the feeling I'm sitting in his chair in his office and so on, so I have a connection with him, and, and I think he approves, he more or less he approves on what we are doing and how we are doing. There's a one planet in the universe that is named after your father and you. They say a planet shines in the universe because it reflects the light of the others. That's quite a contribution, I would say. How much light would you like to reflect? It must be very good light, because now with all the changes of lighting systems, have different kinds of lights, you know. There is a warm light, there is an intimate light. It's like a good light, which will be a little bit yellow, a little bit green, and not too strong, but beautiful. And continuing. And continuing, children. Mr. Director, what a pleasure seeing you. All the best to you and the museum. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.
That is my exclusive interview with Miguel Piotrowski, the director of the State Hermitage Museum. Well, the debate about the source of collection could always be there and probably for a long time to go. And yet, as long as these antiques are with us, as long as they're being shared, we could always draw inspirations from all of them. And with that, we're coming to the end of today's program. We may leave this place, however, the civilizations will always remain. I'm Tian Wei from St. Petersburg. Bye for now.